You're all very welcome here this morning uh, for this launch of our proposals. And as we approach Budget 2023, the demand for change in Ireland has never been stronger. We know that workers and families are under enormous pressure due to the most serious cost of living crisis in 40 years. And life is very hard for people now. Household incomes are squeezed from every direction. The cost of everything keeps going up. Energy bills and motor fuel prices sky high. Rents are extortionate. And the price of food has increased sharply. And the hard reality is that households struggle to afford the basics and they now worry if they will make it through the winter months. They're worried about their jobs, about keeping a roof over their heads, about keeping the lights on. Workers on low and fixed incomes are really hurting. They're pushed to the brink and st struggling to stay afloat. And those on middle incomes are also under increased pressure and calling out for real help. They worry about getting into financial difficulty as they're hammered across the board by utility prices, childcare fees, and the rip-off costs of sending their kids to school and indeed to college. The cost of living shock is compounded by the never-ending crises in housing and healthcare that have worsened on the watch of this tired, failed government. A government that's far too slow to respond, a government that lacks ambition and is out of ideas. So it's time for a fresh start and it is time for change. Bwinin an bushaid a curran shin fein ilohar in you, lesh an ahru shin a horch, is bushaid the nadinie. Bwinin orgwid multi le kunov agus kintakt, a horch the guini kun tarslan as an gevri, agus mujig togel den tauhi, agus a curar fall an tihiukt. So the budget that Sinn Féin presents today is about delivering that change. It's a budget for the people, a budget to turn the tide, to meet the challenges and seize the opportunities to build a better, fairer and stronger Ireland. Our proposals are about giving people help and certainty to get through the winter months while building for the future and delivering the housing and health care that is needed. They are fully costed, but we are making political choices that are different to this government. We're prioritising those on middle and low incomes and a younger generation locked out of opportunity. Sinn Féin's cost of living package recognises that our people need immediate action. They need help now. Our people must be protected from further electricity price hikes this winter. We would cut household electricity bills and cap them at pre-crisis levels. This would give people the assurance that they so desperately need. People need extra support during these difficult times. We would deliver targeted emergency cash payments that give households the flexibility to use that money where it is most needed. The rent crisis must be tackled head on. We deliver for hard pressed renters, putting a month's rent back into their pockets and by banning rent increases for three years. Households are experiencing the biggest squeeze on their incomes for generations. So we would boost workers take home pay by cutting USC. We also have a plan to support households in giving their children the best possible start in life and to ease what are significant pressure points during this crisis. This means reducing childcare fees by two thirds. It means implementing our plan to significantly reduce the cost of education from the first day of primary school right through to graduation from college or the completion of a trade. For our most vulnerable citizens, we would deliver increases in social protection payments of at least 15 euros to cushion the sharpest edges of this crisis. This is the emergency cost of living package our workers and families need. It's credible, it's achievable, and it is exactly what must be done to protect our people. Sinn Féin's budget is about helping people in the here and now, but it also is focused on the future. 
We are ambitious for Ireland, for our people, and we want to seize the big opportunities for our country, but we must get the basics right. The crisis in housing and healthcare have dominated life in Ireland now for a generation, and it's time for that to end. People are fed up with being told that housing and our health service can't be fixed. We don't accept that. Progress demands that we put in place the foundations of a good and secure life for everyone. And getting housing and health care right is at the very centre of that goal. In this budget, we would kickstart the largest social and affordable housing programme in the history of the state by delivering 20,000 homes. In this budget, we would begin the work of building the National Health Service for all of Ireland by immediately reducing the costs of health care, tackling waiting lists and hiring more health care workers. This is the level of ambition that's needed to build a brighter, better future for all our people. Ministers Donoghue and McGrath will take to their feet on Tuesday as the prospect of forced emigration looms <coughs> large for another generation. And that generation will be watching on and looking for a spark of hope. Over the years, too many ministers have told our young people to go, that we can't all live on a small island or that emigration is a lifestyle choice. What a lack of leadership. What a lack of vision. It's time for something different. So to our young people, I say, we need you here in Ireland. Sinn Féin's budget is about you, about putting in place what is needed to allow you to build a life at home with your family, with your friends, with your community. This is where you belong. And your opportunities and well-being, your future, was a big part of the inspiration for Sinn Féin's budget. We are working hard for you and we will not rest until you have the Ireland you deserve. There's nobody more deserving of change than our young. In fact, your aspiration for a better tomorrow drives the intergenerational change that we see right across Ireland. And there is one certainty. Ireland is changed, changing, changing utterly. We saw the latest evidence of this reality in the census figures for the North published yesterday. Make no mistake now, Government cannot continue to look the other way. Change is happening and it is for all of us to seize the opportunity. A future of unity and progress draws closer and a new Ireland is on the horizon. How that new Ireland will be shaped depends on the work that we do today. So Sinn Féin's budget makes financial provision for the establishment of a citizen's assembly on Irish reunification. And I believe that this matter is now urgent. It's time for an inclusive conversation about the future of our country. And that is a future that belongs to everybody who calls this island home. The message we're sending to government today is that budget 2023 must be about change. It must address what really matters to workers and to families treading water and recycling the policies that have failed so badly for 20 years just won't cut it. This is a time for ambition, it's a time for action and a time to deliver. The budget that Piers Doherty and Maureen Farrell will now present is a budget for a stronger, fairer and better Ireland and it is the budget that Sinn Féin would deliver if we were in government. A budget for the people and a budget for change. Piers? From my good day, Mary Lou. Um, and as Mary Lou said, workers and families are in the middle of a cost of living crisis, um, a crisis that we haven't seen in a, in a generation. And households are suffering the biggest drop in living standards since the financial crash. They've seen prices rise faster than their pay packets can bear. We know that energy bills have soared to levels that households will simply be unable to manage. And a Sinn Féin government would support households and provide certainty that they can make it through the winter months. A Sinn Féin government would build for the future, would tackle the problems in housing and in health that have deepened since this government has taken office. And a Sinn Féin government would have definitely different priorities and make better choices than this government. 
The cost of living crisis households are facing is not new. It has been with us for some time, already, already having to contend with a housing crisis, long hospital waiting lists, unaffordable childcare and low pay. The high inflation which began last year has raised the stakes. And most people worry that they won't be able to make it to the end of the week, that they won't be able to afford the bills this winter. Others are already at breaking point. So as we approach this budget after a year of government inaction, we know that the government have failed to get a grip with the cost of living crisis. In fact, in some cases, they have made it worse. And because they are out of touch, they're out of touch with the difficulties our people are facing, and they fail to listen, and they've refused to act. In the past year, the government's response to the energy and cost of living crisis has been the worst and weakest in Europe. And these are the facts. And people ask us, why is the government the slowest and weakest to support workers and families during a time of great difficulty, during a time of hardship and worry? And the answer to that is because they are a government that is out of touch, a government out of ideas, and a government out of time. And our people can no longer afford this government. A Sinn Féin government would act differently and would act now. Sinn Féin would implement an immediate cost of living package to take effect without delay. This plan would give households certainty and support this winter. The government have failed to tackle the energy crisis. That's clear for everybody to see. While Sinn Féin have since last year been calling for reforms for the whole, in the wholesale energy market, the government has been opposing these reforms at European level. While Sinn Féin have called for windfall taxes levied against profiteering energy companies, the government have refused to introduce them. The government have facilitated high energy bills for household and windfall profits for energy companies. Now Sinn Féin would act differently. We would reduce household electricity prices to crease crisis levels and keep them there from October right through the winter months, giving certainty to those households and families in the time ahead and cutting their electricity bills by over half during this period. This can be done. It is what should be done. We would also make cost of living payments to middle and low income earners to assist with other rising costs. These payments would be paid to adult individuals based on incomes. Together with our plan to reduce the USC, this would put 700 euro back into the pocket of an earner earning 30,000 euro and for an on average 600 euro back on into the pocket of somebody on 40,000 euro. And we would make a double payment of child benefit in recognition of the additional needs energy uh, for larger households. Our plan to support and give certainty to households would also protect the vulnerable while expanding eligibility to the fuel allowance to families working on low incomes. Inflation, as we know, impacts everyone, but not equally, with those on lower incomes hit hardest. And one of the most shameful aspects of this government's inaction over the past year has been the refusal to support those on low incomes who have had to make choices that no one should ever have to make. So Sinn Féin would protect those in need. We would help households with the cost of fuel, reducing taxes on petrol, diesel, home heating oil, gas and electricity over the winter months, and we would not increase the carbon tax. For renters and parents struggling with extortionate childcare fees, we will support you, we will help you. A Sinn Féin government would put mon one month's rent back into renters' pockets and ban rent, ban rent increases for the next three years. And we would reduce the cost of childcare by two thirds over the next year. Sinn Féin's plan is the right plan. It would give households the certainty that so many are crying out for this winter. Our proposals to give people help and certainty to get through the winter months while building for the future is underpinned by a fiscal plan that will put the public finances on a sustainable path. Our budget proposals for 2023 include temporary measures across both tax and spending to support households and businesses through this period of high inflation. Sinn Féin's plan would result in an underlying surplus of over 1 billion euro when these costs of living temporary measures are excluded. The underlying surplus rises to over 5 billion euro when other temporary allocations are excluded, including funding for COVID-19, Brexit and the humanitarian response to the war in Ukraine. Permanent increases in expenditure would be put on a sustainable footing. Sinn Féin's fiscal plan is the right one for our citizens. It's ambitious and it's necessary. It supports households while addressing the long-standing problems in health, in housing, in childcare, and to improve the lives of our people. 
We would prioritise those in middle and low incomes, and our plan would put money back into the pockets of those on those incomes by cutting the USC. <coughs> and that is the right thing to do. Workers and families need a break. Households have seen the cost of running a car and heating their home spiral over the past year, and that's why Sinn Féin would step up to support them. We would cut taxes on petrol and diesel, remove the excise duty entirely uh, on home heating oil, uh, resulting in a reduction of about €120 Euro on the fill of home heating oil. This government wants to increase those costs for households. Sinn Féin would cut them. And we would not hike the, hike the carbon tax on struggling households. We would also make our tax system fairer, with those who benefit most from our economy paying their fair share. Sinn Féin would put our finances, public finances, on a sustainable path. And we would support households by increasing incomes and reducing costs. We would boost the income of more than 164,000 workers with a €1.40 increase in the minimum wage. We would protect those on in fixed incomes from inflation by increasing social welfare rates by 1750 over the course of 2023, beginning with an immediate increase this year of €15. Euro. And we would boost the income of pensioners with an immediate increase of €15 Euro in the weekly rate. And we would put money, as I said, back into the pockets of those in middle and low incomes by cutting USC rates. As I said, this is the right thing to do. This is the right response during this period of crisis. We would tackle persistent policy failures in childcare and in housing by giving parents and renters a break and reducing their costs. We put one month's rent back into renters' pockets, ban rent increases, cutting and freezing rents. And we would cut childcare costs by two thirds over the next calendar year. This Akarja, is a budget for the people. It's a budget for change. It's a budget that gives those families, those households certainty right through the winter months, but it is also a budget that plans for the future, that plans to end the crisis in housing and healthcare and build sustainable public services. Gurmagat. Thanks, Piers. Maureen. Uh, um, my generation is locked out of housing and locked out of housing as a result of over a decade of failed housing policies and it came as no surprise to me that 70% of 18 to 24 year olds are now considering moving abroad because that is what my age group did 10 years ago in the post financial crash era and many of those have stayed abroad they have they have built a life for themselves and we as a society have lost out and those who have come back have come back to a country that can't house them and that's simply not the way it should be. We need to build homes and communities and we need to start now by delivering 20,000 social and affordable homes next year. We have a plan to revitalise our towns, villages and rural areas by turning our vacant and derelict houses into homes, accelerating existing public housing delivery and the use of turnkey developments for affordable housing. After long days at work, people of all ages are returning to their rented accommodation that they are just barely able to afford. And we need to support these people by putting one month's rent back in their pockets and giving them certainty for the next three years by freezing rents. This can be done, it needs to be done, and we would deliver it. There is great stress and worry <clears throat> when a member of your family is sick. <clears throat> and that stress and worry should not be compounded by financial fears. As the cost of living increases, this burden is felt all the more heavily by households. We need to bring fairness to the centre of healthcare. And we would start this by expanding eligibility for free GP visits to an additional 300,000 people and tackle the extra burden placed on patients by removing prescription charges for medical card holders and capping monthly spend on medicines at 70 euro. As we move into the winter months, many families fear that a loved one will spend days and nights on a hospital trolley. And this has been, been the reality for far too long, causing strain on patients and our healthcare workers alike. We need additional acute beds. We would deliver 500 additional acute beds. We would also need to expand our critical care capacity, something which has been found lacking too often in the past. And we would see an additional 37 beds next year. If we really want to deliver a fairer healthcare model, then we must plan for the future. 
We certainly need to increase capacity, but we also need to train more of our people to work within our healthcare sector. We would do this by expanding the number of degree places by 1,500, while also training more medical specialists and increasing the number of GPs that we train. The climate crisis is the crisis of our generation and for too long, governments have let this slide. The IPCC reports this year leave us in no doubt of the scale of the climate crisis we're, and we're seeing the real world impacts of climate change. For example, the recent flooding that left a third of Pakistan underwater, killing thousands and displacing millions. Ireland, like all nations, must play its part and we must assist families in making this transition. Our reliance on fossil fuels is, help, is heaping financial hardship on people. We need a fairer retrofit scheme that will lift people out of energy poverty while reducing emissions at the same time. And a lot of families are locked out of the retrofit schemes because they do not meet the criteria for a free energy upgrade, nor do they have the cash reserves to afford a deep retrofit. 10% of households rely on solid fuels as their source of heating, and we would establish a new retrofit scheme targeted at these families. Families want to install solar panels, they're telling us this, and we need to help them do that. And that will help them bring them down their bills and help alleviate pressure um, as well. My colleagues, Donna Holira and Don, uh, Darren O'Rourke, um, have consistently been calling for solar panels um, on schools and have published legislation to remove planning permission um, for the installation of these on the schools. We also need to make public transport affordable and more accessible to help drive down emissions. And that includes giving people in rural Ireland sustainable transport options like rural bus services and rail such as the Western Rail Corridor. We would expand, we would extend the 20% fare reduction to commercial op operators um, to reach our most rural communities, including our offshore islands. Expanding the school transport is a common sense environmental move as it takes thousands of cars off the road each day while also helping parents balance their work commitments. So Sinn Féin are proposing climate action measures that both improve people's lives and also reduce carbon emissions. So just um Lene Kinolarong Ega um who am I treating Shin on Sofa Kaha Mujina um Honkaru Ladina. Honkaru Ladina e Jeremy Chihiochta Tasi and Fihe Mila Chach um on Vlin Shahog and Kahamuj Kauru Lobsha Lob Shud Ata Och Orison Nuchach Erkis Akum Kashi Shin Aragador All Arash Ishjah in a Guj Poki a Humala Shin Agzeganam Kena Kamuj um Kinchu Nah Mwil Ordu Er Hisna Erfa Trafsha Efa um Triblina Humala Shin Kahamuj Nismu Kinchok the Horch Godina Xi the Golish Jachan or Go Jospa Jail, Kahamuj Kinch Kinchok the Horch Go Freshen, a Jeremy Costas, Agus Dinna um in a good chili um Sinospa Jail new um Mata Fibnis Lancha Akub. So Togalor and Shin Agus Tomaj and we saw the Keshni Ragach and the Freshen. Okay. So Thanks, Gurmaga Dosh uh, Maureen. So I'm going to take questions. I'm going to take them in batches, if that's OK. Could Joe or somebody give me a pen? I've no pen, so just so I can too. keep track of things. Sorry. Sorry. Technical hitch here. So we'll start, we'll, start, uh, we'll start with you. And then I'll go to Harry. The 9% um, battery that's not mentioned in the uh, my percent of the tourism hospitality industry is very willing to let that expire in, in February. Um, okay, yeah. I present. Okay, thanks, you. Uh, Harry? Um, yeah, one of your um, uh, displays behind you was saying that the, um, that the cap on electricity uh, would cost 700 million, but on your document is saying 900 million between now and the end of the year, and then 700 million for January. And February, so which figure is right? Okay. What's going to happen after February if prices don't go down? Are you going to revert to the prices that they were at before at, beforehand? And as well, with the other cost of living measures, what are you going to do if the uh, inflation and energy prices continue to soar after February? Okay, I hear that. Okay, thanks very much. Paul? Oh. Uh, yeah, there's a, a provision for existing levels of service at 2.2 billion. The Parliamentary Budget Office said on Wednesday. That might be way out of kilter with what might actually be needed. Is there any provision in case 
ELS is, is above 2.2 billion. Okay, Anna. Yeah, and um, just on, Marilyn, you said about people leaving the country because of yep. wages, low wages. It's not a concern. I mean, you're talking about, um, where is it? Reduce, removing, removing tax credits for individual incomes above 100K, introducing a 3% solidarity tax on a portion of income above 140. You're going to go the opposite way and you're going to force the likes of the, the Google execs the doctors, you're going to force them out. So how are you going to make up that shortfall and all that PRSI and tax that you're going to miss out on? Um, and then similarly, just back to the electricity bills, um, you're going to have to fund the difference between June 2021 and whatever the prices go up to, which we don't know. It, that's going to create a burden for years and years to come. So how are you going to fund that difference? Is it going to be through increased taxes for everyone else then? Okay, so thanks, thanks for those questions. I'll come back and I'll, I'll come to you, Mary, after we get through these. Maybe start with then that issue, Piers, around the energy cap, um, the the figure that Harry raised, um, the issue of 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 how how we um, how you sustain it, what happens at the end of February. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Harry, for the question. Yeah, so the the, the slides are showing two different things. So they're showing the cost of living package that we want to see um, between now and the end of the year. And obviously the energy cap will apply for three months during that year, which would be 900 million. But also the energy cap would still apply to 2023, which is the 2023 budget. So that's the, the other 700 million. The, the total cost of this would be uh, 1.6 billion euro, we estimate. Um, and, and that's factoring in not only the increases that have been flagged that, that are due to kick in next month, but it's also factoring in the potential for further increases in energy during the, the period uh, that we want to see the, the, the cap on. And this is absolutely crucial for households. People are, are screaming out for certainty. Uh, there's many things that we can control, but on this issue, this is something that the government can do. Indeed, back in March, the European Commission set out in their toolbox that this is one of the options that governments could do in terms of price certainty for, for consumers. And that's why so many countries across Europe have done it. That's why France have done it. That's why Austria have done it. The Danes are doing it. Netherlands have announced they're doing it. Uh, Romania has done it. You know, so many countries across Europe have, 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 have now done this. And this is what Ireland can do to provide that certainty uh, for individuals during that peak period in terms of the winter, because you asked why the winter. The winter is a time of immense pressure in terms of energy costs. Um, and that's why we've, we've taken that. But of course, everything has to be kept under review. Now, second to that, and I mentioned in my opening remarks, Sinn Féin have been long calling for uh, the, the, the reform of the wholesale energy energy market. We've been raising this since last year. You'll, uh, you'll know that Eamon Ryan signed a joint statement arguing that that market should not be changed. Uh, that's completely the wrong view because, um, and Europe has now come to the view that the, it has to be changed. Um, but the government has taken the wrong stance here because what the, uh, by doing that, what they've allowed is uh, energy producers, particularly wind energy, to uh, record immense profits because it is, it's, it's levelled at the, the cost of producing uh, gas uh, fueled energy. Uh, so that measure, along with the other measure that Europe is, is planning to bring in, which is the excessive profit tax, uh, which we have again been calling for, which Pascal Donoghue argued against in the Budget Reoversight Committee, um, th th those measures will also, in our view, have potentially a downward pressure in relation to energy costs. Um, but all of this has to be kept under review. And I think in the middle of a cost of living crisis driven by what is happening in Ukraine, uh, the government has to be, any government would have to be nimble. But what we have to do is know what is happening right here, right now. And that is there is a winter of dread for many families. And that's why Sinn Féin are saying provide that certainty. Reduce electricity costs back to where they were last year, which is about €1,200 Euro per annum less than what uh, has been charged now and keep them at that uh, fixed price during the, the winter months. Just out of the sums, just the overall uh, cost of your package is 13.5 billion. There are two packages and they're combined 9.5 billion euro. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So the, the, the cost of living package of 4.1 is out of this year, and you'll see that that will still, re that will still provide a surplus to the state this year. And the cost and the package for 2023, uh, the net package is, is, is 9.4 billion. Some of that is already pre-committed expenditure and, and so on. Uh, and um, that, that also provides us with a balanced budget next year. And crucially, some of that is one-off. Um, so there's one-off cost of living measures that we want to introduce, uh, which aren't core repeat, repeated expenditure. But also there's about four and a half billion euro of one-off expenditures that the government has <laughs> in, in that package as well, which is to deal with the Ukrainian crisis, COVID, um, and also the, the aftermath of Brexit. So I let you away with that, Harry. Sorry about you. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, what, what about Hugh's question around the 9% VAT rate, Pierce, um, and, and Paul? I can get it on the, Yeah, it, Sinn Féin we'll supported the, the 9% VAT rate, um, and it's been extended to the end of February. Uh, we don't propose to extend it beyond that date. Um, look, I've been very vocal as of the party in relation to uh, some of those in the hospitality sector, particularly the hotel sector, in terms of the price gouging that has taken place within the sector. Uh, and I think that's the, 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 the need to stop that. Um, but crucially, what businesses are looking for now, uh, both in the hospitality sector and other sectors, is the support with their energy bills. Uh, and that's where, where we're focused in. So over the period of the winter, we have a 500 million euro package to support uh, businesses uh, in the hospitality sector, but also in other sectors, retail manufacturing, uh, with their energy costs. And this is a model, uh, for example, that applies in Luxembourg, where the state would take on a portion of their, their energy bills. And that's where businesses are really at. If you're talking to people in the hospitality sector, that's what they're talking to you about. It's about the fact that their bills have increased, uh, you know, more than doubled, sometimes trebled, uh, and they need support at this point in time. Yeah, so I suppose ELS. just in relation to the e ELS, I mean, obviously it was the 2.2 that was in the summer economic statement, but we have, I've been consistently meeting with deeper officials in, in relation to that specific um, figure and th they don't see any change at this point. Um, so <clears throat> that, that's what we're providing for at this point. Um, but that is what I've literally been getting back in parliamentary questions, etc., and meetings. So just on that issue then around the, the proposal around um, the solidarity tax that was raised at, uh, bear in mind that's if you're an individual that earns in excess of 140,000 euros. I mean, that's a very small proportion of working people in the Irish economy and more power to them for their efforts, their and their good luck. Um, but, but we believe that it is appropriate to level an additional burden on people in that income bracket. And I, I have to say to you, the, the reason why I, I, that we hear from people who are leaving or people who are away and feel that they can't come back, um, issues around taxation have never been raised with me, ever as a reason for, for not coming home. But it's the people here now and yeah. these big multinational companies, and we know where, how reliant we are on the corporation Well, I, I think you're coming at this, I th with respect, I think you're coming at th this wrong. Uh, I think the reality is now, and this is the scale of the crisis that we have in housing. It's not now just a limited thing for the usual suspects who, are, who, who find themselves uh, on the wrong side of things. For the very organizations that you cite, many of them are located within a stone's throw of here. The issue of sustainable accommodation now for them is key. Sorry, let me finish. And increasingly, in decisions to invest, decisions to expand, decisions to stay, will be about the quality of life, the level of services, the availability of accommodation, crucially, that we can provide here. We are not proposing, we absolutely recognize that FDI is a critical part of the Irish economic model. So that's, take that as read. In fact, I was in on the West Coast recently meeting with some of these organizations. Of course, we want them to invest, we want them to come here, and we want them to stay. But the reality is that you have to provide the infrastructure, the services and so on, that make that an attractive proposition. And you have to have an equitable and balanced taxation system and those who, as I say, individuals on 140,000 euros, how many of those would be in the economy? 
look, it brings in a significant S amount of resources for us as well, yeah. which is the, the key issue here in this about choices. Well, I, I don't think that uh, there is any sign uh, that anything that we are saying would cause that kind of the kind of worry that you're expressing. Um, I, I don't accept that for a second. And even in the run-up to this um, uh, budget, I've met with a number of different businesses, and obviously you'll be aware that Galway is um, quite reliant on FDI. Um, and the key issue that these businesses raised with me was housing in Galway in terms Absolutely. of rented. It was there was no question. It wasn't even just the cost of it, it was actually the fact that there's, there was a lack of places for people to come uh, um, into Galway and, and that surrounding area. So it, that is the key issue that if people were raising with us. They didn't raise um, this particular measure. And when I go into those meetings, I'm very clear about what our measures are. You know, um, they know exactly where we stand on this, but, but it isn't something that was raised. Okay, so thanks for that. Mary? Can you just the tax, the energy cap as well, and how that will be funded in years to come? Sorry, it's, so, so it's for... for it's yeah, for five months. Well, yeah. I, I think that question was answered, but... It's, it's, it, it's not about funding it in the years to come. This is time limited. This is, this is a one-off. So therefore, it, it, it isn't going to be... It isn't, doesn't have to be funded over again. It doesn't go into the base. It's not repetitive. It's one-off. It's from here now right through the winter and giving people certainty during that period. So it has to be funded now, but it doesn't repeat itself again and again and again. But you don't know how much it's going to cost because you don't know how much... Well, we do. Well, we, we do. We've actually we do given you the figure. We've, we've factored in for increases in electricity costs, and that's why we want to give certainty to families. So we have provided for 230 million euro of additional increases in electricity costs uh, later this year, the start of next year. So it's not, the proposal isn't that this would be a, a permanent fixture in the, in the policy environment. This is clearly an emergency intervention at a time of an emergency. Uh, Mary. You're next, and then John. Yeah, just, just following up on that electricity price cap, just wondering um, here's how certain really or how confident are you that it will stay under that 1.6 billion? Um, you know, given the uncertainty and not say the prices, or do you accept that there is some element of risk in this, but it is a risk that you see as worth taking? And secondly, you just have allocated uh, 4.1 billion, I think, for the total cost of living package. Um, that seems modest enough. You know, surplus for the year. Mm -hmm. So, are you pro proposing not holding something back as the government is proposing for next winter, um, given that you know further help will probably be needed next winter if this energy crisis is prolonged? Thanks, Mary. John. Uh, I, would, I, I I realise this, this, this re re refers to current expenditure, so you may not be addressing the the government's recent proposals on pensions. Could you just expand on the um, the section you have in the Department of Social Wealth, Social Protection, restore right to retire and pension for 65 year olds by reintroducing state pension. Sure. Transition. Because I understood that there still is some facility where you can retire at 65 and go on a temporary social. Job seeking. Okay. Job seeking payment. I stress I haven't studied so this. Job seeking yeah. so yeah. yeah. payment. Yeah, no, we'll come to a long way off. Okay. Is, is that myself? <laughs> Uh, for us all, John. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you too. Um, good. Um, yeah. On the fence, if I'm reading this correctly, it looks like there's only 25 million extra at a time when there's war in Europe. And Minister Comey is planning to in increase the spend on the fence to 500, by 500 million by 2028 on the back of the Commission of the Future of the Defence Forces. Does Sinn Féin not agree with that increase, or is it simply not the right time to start? Sorry. Yeah. And um, this just kind of steps aside from your, your proposed budget, but um, we have today the last of five Ireland shares were sold, and Grace, you don't mind giving a comment. They sold for six point seven million, um, and the bailout was four point seven. Would you say that that's a successful program that was completed today? And the other thing is, and um, you're all due a one thousand euro pay increase, and um, in a couple of days' time, you're already on hundred k plus. What's your reaction to that? It's saving for households struggling to make ends meet. Okay. Joe, who are you indicating to us? Uh, yeah. Sorry, Ari. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Ari. Yeah. Just my attention may to be arrived. John, come on. To Shibara in love one, which should be given a back to Shibara Vine, the Taki of the Horse Guns Ramog. I want to Shibara Ish Shaska Kui Ger and Isha Finch and Kibe Sagir Ashin or her PRSI. Okay, good morning. 
Okay, so um, the energy cap, Mary had a question to you, Pierce, on that. Yeah, uh, look, um, Mary, uh, what, what we've done here is we've looked at the, the cost, the average cost of energy uh, that a household was paying before the crisis, which was a thousand euro. As I said, the cost that board gas are charging, the average, the same household now would be 2,300. Uh, we've looked at the number of houses, we've looked at the CSO data in terms of electricity consumption during the period. So therefore the cost of this measure of energy prices were to remain static would be about one point, just under 1.4 billion euro. Prices are signalled in advance. Customers are, have been told quite, uh, quite a while that prices are going to increase on the 1st of October. But there could be another price signal. There could be another price signal in a couple of weeks' time, and therefore we factored in a qu nearly a quarter of a billion euro for, it, for, the, for the potential of prices to rise. And exactly that is exactly the reason why we need this measure, because either the state takes it on and takes that pressure and relief off families, or the state abandons those families and says you have to paddle your own canoe in, to, in relation to what happens in terms of energy prices. We want to provide certainty in terms of households that their electricity bills will be cut by over half during the winter period and that it will not go up. This isn't something novel. Like, this isn't something novel. I know the government uh, are out with their sound bites, but right across Europe, this is happening. You know, in the last 72 hours, two other countries have announced that they're going to bring in price certainty for their customers. It's happening in about nine or ten different uh, countries across Europe. It is part of the Commission's toolbox that was announced back in March. This can be done. This is all only the only thing about this issue. It's about political choices, and it's very clear that the government don't want to take this political choice to give certainty of a reduction and price certainty over the winter period for electricity. Sinn Féin have different priorities. We're very clear that. Families cannot take any more, and that's why we would uh, provide that certainty and that reduction in terms and of electricity nothing prices. In the tank. Well, first of all, let, let me make this point. And you'll be aware that the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council have um, made the point numerous times that there is two and a half billion euro of discretionary money that is done still unallocated uh, and is available for one-off measures in terms of cost of living measures, um, which they believe should be utilised by the government to support families at the end of the year. They also project on top of that a 4.5 billion euro surplus. So there is money in the tank. That's, that, that's the first thing. This is, a, this is not only just having a balanced budget, but this provides a surplus uh, at the end of the year. Uh, but we also need to recognise that right across Europe, and I put up the graph here, this graph isn't created by Sinn Féin, Financial Times in Bruegel did the, the, did the assessment of where countries are at in supporting households and supporting businesses since, since September of last year. And Ireland is the worst in Europe in relation to its support. We have to step in, we have to provide the supports, and we have to help people uh, get through this winter. Uh, and then we have to look forward to planning for the, for, for the future. In relation, do you want me to the pensions or? Yeah. yeah. So, so you're on the road. Um, well, I suppose just on taking um, John's um, question, um, I suppose, like m myself, John, we're both far off the pension age, but um, I think the, imp the important thing here is that we need to recognise um, the people that have, you know, worked really long, um, hard days, uh, labour-intensive jobs, and to move um, to have this transitional pay uh, pension payment. So at the moment, um, those people would be taking a job seekers payment. So it would be have that tra transitional um, pension payment. August Togeman Kian and Aiga Freshen Matasha Shin all right Latsa. So just to engage that she's more than more than Yerhan. No, Sheilam could go how much brand new air air gone ash nice jihud on realtish mar rud gun sochier fad. I guess gone drama one her and I dram Ella. A humalish in ta she siflana ta an um a Jeremy e shaska kuig mar finchin ta she shin ta kostish an a gorishin. A humalish in is much in thane dram a vinsiglarch for PRSI as a brand new air ek sulocht mar yolarshin. So so to galor on a to di to galor on gun sochi er fad as before gun brand new air honash nice gun sochi er fad shachas jir her dram one a her a gun yer dram ella. Good morning. Bank of Ireland shares, Moray asked about that. Yeah, um, look, I, I, I don't think you can look at Bank of Ireland shares in relation to this is what we paid out and this is what we got back in. And some of that was in relation to a guarantee and so on. Because the cost 
of, the, of bailing out Bank of Ireland and the other banks will never be able to put down on a, on a ledger. The cost of that there was tens of thousands of people in forced immigration. The cost of that there was governments cutting the minimum wage. The cost of that was slashing social welfare protections. The cost of that was hundreds of thousands of people out of jobs. It will never, that pain, which still people in communities are still trying to, uh, to, 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 to come back from, that pain will never be able to be put down on a, on a ledger book. Um, we've made it very clear in relation to Bank of Ireland shares that the issue here needs to be value for money and the right time to sell the shares. What we are very concerned about is that the government want to divest its shares from AIB. We believe that AIB, we should remain as a majority shareholder in terms of AIB. And I think you can just see uh, the fact that AIB and its board uh, try to remove cash services from a large number of its branches. Let me make this clear. If AIB uh, weren't in majority shareholding of the state, those cash services would be withdrawn. We need to, in my view, uh, retain a, a, a majority shareholder within that, that financial institution. Um, on defence, uh, yes, it's a, it's a stepped increase. Uh, as you mentioned, the government have a plan. We recognise that that increase has to a, a increase uh, significantly over the next number of years. But this budgets are all about choices. And the choices at this point in time for us is to ensure that families and workers have that help, that certainty to get through the winter, and then dealing with the other major crises that we have in terms of housing, building the 20,000 social and affordable housing next year, investing to end the crisis in our healthcare service by reducing cost, extending capacity, uh, and employing the workforce of the future, and also tackling the climate change crisis. So everything can't be done in the, in the first year, we recognise that, but this is a, a, a modest increase uh, on a pathway to a more sustainable uh, and further increases in terms of defence. We were asked also about the pay increase, and, and you're right, I think it'll sit very badly with lots of people who are struggling. The idea that politicians are getting a, another raise, I mean, we hear that loud and clear, uh, we won't be taking that, but you know that's been our position for quite some time, for years actually. So, if you don't mind, just on that. Sorry, no, Gavin. No, it, it, just, go ahead, Gavin. As, as it happens, just on that. No, you, you've outlined that on item twelve point four in your public expenditure measures, and you're still proposing that the Tisha Tonish the ministers, office holders, effectively, would still get to receive fifty percent of the increase that they are due under these deals. Uh, one would think that if you were consistent, you'd either say. They should get it or they shouldn't and if you don't think it's tenable then why would you still propose to let them have that? Well, I think the, the point in that there Gavin isn't that they can keep 50% of the increase. We want to actually cut the allowance for the Tisha by 50%, for ministers by 50% and office holders so there will be a substantial reduction in relation to the take home pay of those individuals. So it's the salary top of it, it's not the... It's the top of a, of a TD, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. So yeah. Just to clarify that, Philip please. Yeah, could I just ask, just on the unity issue, um, there's, a, there's you know, the funding that you put there aside, one is for the Citizen Assembly and then some cross-border money for uh, various agencies. There's, there's, maybe I missed it, but there's no mention of the Shared Ireland unit is that something you would continue to keep in keep in action and would you fund it and, and how much would you put in and then just on the back of the, the, the Northern Ireland census as well which shows um, for the first time the amount of uh, Catholics has increased greatly in the north just for all three of you and um, when's the last time you went to mass and how regularly do you go to mass um, that's okay so I, I don't think that's an appropriate no, question to ask anyone anyway, so we will be answering you. So just to say, I mean, the interesting thing about the census is that uh, it demonstrates, again, the fact that change is happening. You saw it in the election in May. Uh, you've seen it in a success succession of elections, actually, where the unionist uh, electoral majority is gone. It's not coming back. And now, of course, we have uh, Michelle O'Neill, for the first time a nationalist, a Republican, uh, as first minister designate. So, there's been several straws in the wind over the last number of years that tell us categorically the things are changing. So the question then is, what do we do about that? Um, do we simply, as the government has done thus far, stick their head in the sand and say, no, we can't talk about the change? I think that's a very dangerous course of action. I think it's potentially a very destabilizing course of action. Or do we talk about it? So, You'll have heard me, you're probably sick listening to me, Philip, saying to Leo Vradkar in his time, to Michal Martin in his time, um, that the conversation 
the planning, the dialogue, which has to be inclusive, needs to start now. We think the best vehicle for that is through a citizens' uh, assembly. So we've made uh, an allocation in this budget very deliberately for that. This, by the way, is, is, would not be a huge cost to the state financially. What's, what's lacking here is just the political realism and the political ambition to, to seize this moment. So we're, we're making that call again. Um, I note that Tatanish, though, will be speaking at an event, I think, next weekend, not this weekend, next weekend, an Ireland's Future event. Um, uh, perhaps he might, on, on the part of government, take the opportunity to make an announcement along this, these veins. Um, on the shared island unit, uh, that's Micheál Martin's baby, uh, if you like, uh, and in, in it, as much as it does what it does, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's good enough, but it's not a substitute for what actually needs to happen. And finally, just bear in mind, the reason why this Catholic Protestant kind of headcount thing becomes an issue is because that's the basis upon which the Northern state was founded. It was as crude as that. It was entirely undemocratic. It was a crude sectarian head to count uh, at the end of, uh, of, of British guns threatening immediate and terrible war, but you all know your history. Uh, but now, the really interesting and the really, really positive thing is that the census figures tell you so much more than who denominates as Catholic or Protestant. It tells you so much more about the huge diversity now in Northern society. So, to those who who's have said to us consistently, you know, now is not the time, don't be rushing the fences. Now is the time. Now is the time to talk. Now is the time to share ideas. Now is the time to plan. And it's a modest allocation in the budget, but we don't need huge sums of money to get this underway. We need a government that is realistic enough and ambitious enough to actually frame and shape this discussion. So thank you for that question. Okay. Do you thank see, you. Do you do, see sorry, a role no. for the shared island unit, the continuing role? Okay. The, the, well, just, the money is in the base. It's in the so, base, So yeah. it's, it, the money is repetitive. This, the, what we're outlining here is what is, is, is the additional factor. So we're not making a saving. We're not cutting the money in terms of the shared island unit. It is there. Said and a lot of the, the resources, as you know, John, that the Sherrod Island unit deals with in terms of infrastructure plan, my God, they've been baked in yeah. for far too long. The issue has been delivery. So we're not, what we're proposing is an additional uh, initiative. <laughs> uh, of course, were we in government, uh, of course, we would reserve the, the right to take a different and, and a deeper approach. But we've told me, Homer, I've told on Taoiseach, uh, in respect of his shared island unit, that of course, talking and interact, all of that's good stuff. So of course we support it. But where we differ with him uh, significantly is it's not enough. It's not enough now when change has progressed to this level and where further change in the course of this decade is imminent. So the smart approach, the responsible political approach is to get that conversation and that planning started now. There's, there's no room for any further delay. That's our, that's our core point. Why is Thank it you for the questions. Why is it inappropriate to ask the leaders of It's inappropriate, Philip, if I have to explain it to you. Of, no, but in the context of it being very much celebrated about the, the, the amount of people who consider to send Catholics in. in Philip, if you I'm are celebrating religions. the fact that lots of people are Catholics, that's entirely a matter for yourself. It's not appropriate to ask anyone in our view what their religious disposition is and whether they're practicing or not. It's just not appropriate. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.